Welcome to the Ford School Policy Talk today with Dr. Lisa uh, Cook, Professor of Economics and International Relations at Michigan State University. She was the first Marshall Scholar from Spelman College and received a second BA in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics uh, from Oxford University. She earned her PhD in Economics from Berkeley with field economics and international economics. Uh, in 2011-2012, she served as a senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors. She is currently a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a member of the Council of uh, International, uh, I'm sorry, Council of Foreign Affairs. She's on the advisory board of the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis the advisory board of the Hamilton Center for the Study of Innovation and Invention at the Smithsonian Institute and the board of directors at the Roosevelt Institute. And it's been my pleasure to serve with her on the executive committee of the American Economic Association. Our event today is co-sponsored by the Students of Color and Public Policy. And the goal is for the two of us uh, to have a discussion about her research on innovation and diversity and then open it up to questions, uh, your questions, which you can send in the chat box. Um, so Lisa, thank you so much for being here today. I've really been looking forward to having this conversation with you. The pleasure is all mine, Betsy. Um, so I was going to start with um, something that um, it's sort of, a, I think, maybe an unusual place, but I wanted to talk about your favorite uh, uh, inventor uh, who is an African-American or a person of color that you think the world doesn't pay enough attention to. I think that anybody who has uh, seen me give this seminar in person knows who this is. This is Lonnie Johnson, uh, both the inventor of the super soaker and apologies to my friends who have uh, small children, but uh, it, I think that his story is just incredible. He works on both uh, nuclear energy, um, battery power, and on improving the super soaker. Uh, and I think that invention is living. It's not just dead. Our uh, history of invention is one that is living and uh, not just in the past. So I would say Lonnie, uh, Lonnie Johnson. That is such an amazing and excellent answer. And I am going to share that with my kids uh, who, <laughs> uh, my, my youngest aspires to be an inventor. And when I tell him about the, inventor of the super soaker. I think that's going to really inspire him. Um, <laughs> one of the reasons I wanted to start there, I was going to tell you a, a funny backstory. Um, although I say funny, it's not funny at all. It's actually super disturbing to me. But I was doing research on representation and principles of economics textbooks. So mm -hmm. thinking about where women show up and where men show up and where people of color show up. And there's a very well-known uh, textbook um, one of the most commonly used, and it had a page, an entire page in the book, which listed inventors and what they invented. There were 24 inventors on that list, two women, zero people of color. And so I was like, wait a minute, there's only 24 inventors. You're telling me you couldn't come up with a more diverse group of people to list on your page? Um, and that sent me down a rabbit hole of trying to look for, you know, who who are inventors, who are people of color, who are women that I would want to see on that page. Um, and uh, I, I was telling you, uh, Lisa, by by email that one of my favorites um, is the guy who invented uh, the shoe lasting machine. And that sounds very like whatever. Yeah, but this like guy, yeah. Um, yeah. So Max Leger, the thing that was amazing was he was working on shoes during the day and coming home at night and trying to invent an, to try to invent a machine that would mm -hmm. replace him. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. fact, his machine went the very best, most skilled shoemaker could make up to make around fifty shoes a day. And mm -hmm. 
when he invented his machine, his machine could do 700 shoes a day. Think about that productivity increase. And then I think about the story they're trying to tell in the Principles of Economics textbook. And I'm thinking, why don't they want this guy who invented his way out of his job and took productivity from 50 to 700, right? Shouldn't he be like uh, at the top of the list? So let's Sorry. start by talking about that. What's going on with 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 people like that getting forgotten in things like our textbooks? What do you think is driving that? I think that that's a really good example. There's so many like that in history. And it may be that economists and historians are not meeting the textbook writers. Uh, I don't know, I don't have a really good answer, but we can look to the cotton gin. The cotton gin was invented by an African-American enslaved person. It just happened to be that Eli Whitney was visiting that plantation that day and got to the patent office first. It's one of the most litigated patents in, in American history. And it's not because the enslaved person was suing uh, Eli Whitney is because plantation owners who used the technology and improved it were contesting it with Eli Whitney. That's one uh, one story. Uh, same true with uh, someone who is local to us, to Michigan, to Ypsilanti, uh, Michigan, uh, the, the real McCoy, Elijah the real McCoy, and that's where the term comes from. He made an oil dispenser that was just so precise. He did a, a degree in engineering in, in Edinburgh and came back, settled in the Detroit Ypsilanti area, and this was so precise that it cut down the number of engine fires by about 67%. And this was an amazing, and a very simple technology, very simple technology. And it was able to save lives and to save cargo and to increase the amount of uh, transportation we were able to do. That was a very critical point. I don't know, frankly, why these stories are left out. And one thing that I find often in textbooks is that this, this kind of invention stops uh, in the early 1900s, you know, people refer to uh, George Washington Carver or Madam C.J. Walker. They don't talk about James West, one of the most famous um, inventors at Bell Labs, you know, who is still living and is on the advisory board of the Lemelson Center with me. You know, I think that this is part of the part of the problem that we don't look deep enough. We look past. Uh, people and often their stories aren't told just like a number of women's stories aren't told with respect to invention. Their names are sometimes left off. I've been in a number of USPTO meetings um, in, in the past whereby women have told me that they discovered that their work had been patented and the men on the team were listed and the women on the team were not. So I, I find that to be an increasingly common story. And I certainly hope that these inventors, uh, women and African Americans can become uh, better known or of, of all ethnicities and all races can become uh, better known and reflected in our textbooks and elsewhere. Well, so one reason I, I like to start there is because one of the criticisms when I did this work that showed that the vast majority of almost all the examples and principles of economics textbooks are men and almost all white men was some people hit back and said, well, you know, what do you want me to do? Change Paul Volcker into Pauline Volcker. That was literally a, a comment made by an economist. And I think that the, the obviously the implication is that they're just in history there were, you know, they're not important women and not important people of color. And I think that's wrong. So, I, you know, right. one point is that it, they're, it, that, that's just wrong. They're, they're definitely there. But you've also done work on the disincentives that have been created that actually have held back um, people of color. And so I wanted, I wanted to start with the glass half full part. Look, they're there. 
and we need to tell those stories. But there's also, you also have told the glass half empty story, um, which is that there are things that have inhibited um, that. And so I wanted to turn to that a little bit and, and your work on violence and the role that that has played and in mm-hmm. fact, in impacting you know, invention and incentives in the African-American community. So before we pivot to that, I just would like to um, once again uh, address the other uh, textbook writers or or editors. Um, This isn't the only place where we uh, have uh, central bank governors, right? Um, Russia had one when I was living there in the in the uh, 1990s, in 1995, and other countries have had uh, or had uh, central bank governors or uh, Fed chairs, as we have, uh, much before. So we don't necessarily need to just refer to our history. Our history is uh, imperfect and late in that regard, but we can find some other examples in a number of different places. But anyway, you've written your test book. I'll, I'll leave them alone for right now. Uh, but moving on to disincentives, I let me start with the backstory with respect to my research on violence and economic activity that includes a measure of economic activity, which is innovation, invention or innovation. So I'm happily doing my dissertation research in Moscow. I'm asking about the banking system, whether a a banking system that allocates credit on a market basis can arise in the ashes of the socialist system that used to be the case in uh, Russia. And I'm interviewing, entrepreneurs, I'm interviewing bankers, trying to figure out if this market has already arrived. And if so, if it's truly allocating uh, credit on a market basis. And it turned out, yes, that price signals were were being used and uh, there was a small uh, market for credit, uh, but it was being intermediated by something else, by trade credit. So this bank lending was being held. So I discovered this new, that was the this uh, new uh, intermediary that was trade credit. So that was sort of my dissertation. So in the process of talking to entrepreneurs and bankers, they posed questions to me. And uh, sometimes that was helping my Russian and sometimes it wasn't, but (laughs) they posed questions to me nonetheless. They were asking me, so if we have intellectual property laws on the books and we have everything that the economics literature says we need to have in order for invention and innovation to happen, why isn't it happening? And, you know, I didn't have a good answer for them. And I was saying, you know, first of all, I need to get out of here and write my own dissertation. Like, you know, I don't need a new dissertation topic, but it bugged me. I put it on the back burner. I came back, finished up my dissertation, but I kept thinking about that question. Why was it that intellectual property rights protection on the books wasn't enough? Well, I thought maybe there's a historical experiment that could be helpful in explaining to the Russians why this wasn't uh, evolving. And I looked to the uh, economic history of the United States. So we have, if we're gonna have uh, an historical experiment, we need for uh, there to be a treated group and a control group. And and in this case, African-American inventors would have been the treated group. They were subjected to uh, different types of violence, uh, major riots. Uh, lynching, segregation laws, and a control group that wouldn't have been uh, as subject to those types of violence. And what I found was that lynching in particular had a a negative effect on invention and innovation, on on patenting. And I also found that uh, it had a, a, segregation laws had especially a bad effect, a negative effect on the most valuable patents, on electrical patents. And when you talk about disincentives, the disincentive is the lack of rule of law. And that's what transcends this time period and also transcends space. So this informed how the Russians could think about 
their own environment. It's not just the protection of intellectual property rights they needed. They needed the protection of the rule of law, which included uh, personal security, included uh, contract enforcement. So it wasn't just a narrow slice of property rights protection. Um, it was a full complement of property rights protection that they needed. So I, I think that economics is really flexible in that way that we can take a, an experience of a group of people in economic history and uh, extrapolate that to the current environment. Um, you know, that is such a great explanation of how, as economists, we try to you know, focus on something that seems like a narrow question, but actually use it to draw really big implications about the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think those are, um, you know, some some pretty uh, big uh, implications. How do you take that and think about what you think means for the long run implications of uh, discrimination and violence in terms of innovation? I think there are two really staggering uh, statistics. Well, actually, let me let me give you one. I'll save the uh, other one for later. There's one staggering statistic in this data set that I put together that stretches from um, 1870 to 2010. It is that 1899 is still, until 2010 at least, and I would say that, that 2021 20, uh, isn't that different from 2010 with respect to this statistic, is still the peak year, 1899 is still the peak year for per capita patenting for African-Americans. The average size of a patent team, the median size of a, a, a patent team for African-Americans is still what it was in 1899. That's outrageous. That is just so shocking. And I think that is uh, a result of Plessy versus Ferguson in the first instance. Um, a lot of the, the networks, the uh, infrastructure that you need for invention and innovation was taken away. So that's public libraries. You go and check the patent digest to see what new inventions there are. You couldn't go to a patent attorney uh, because those became segregated. The commercial districts became segregated. So I think this was a real blow to African-American invention, and uh, this had persistent effects. And as a macroeconomist, this is a kind of, of shock that I am uh, most interested in, one that is persistent, lasts a long time, and we have to think about interventions to uh, bring that up to at least the peak uh, period, but to do better than that. So, I, you know, I was thinking about asking you sort of where are we today, but it sounds like um, where we are today is uh, not in a great place, right? That statistic where right. the right. patent rate, is, you know, 120 years later is the same. Yeah. So let me actually have you think about this in a different way, something as a historian you've probably thought about. Um, you know, there's uh, Robert Gordon and some of the other sort of macroeconomists who basically said the problem for the world is that we've run out of good ideas. Um, and we'll never have inventions and innovation as good as what we had 100 years ago. And that's why we're never going to have really fast economic growth again. Um, what do you say to that? How do you think about it? I I don't think that's quite right. I and my co-author, Yan Yan Yang, have, have calculated that GDP per capita could be 0.6% to 4.4% higher if there were greater participation of women and African-Americans. So it's not that we've run out of ideas. If you rely on the same old people, you're gonna get the same old ideas. And as a macroeconomist, I would say that's true whether we're talking about innovation or we're talking about stemming financial crises or preventing financial crises. If you rely on the same old people, they're going to ask the same questions and you're not going to get that much uh, innovation. But if you are embracing diversity and the diverse way people answer questions and come up with solutions, 
I think that we would have a higher GDP and that's what we calculated and therefore a higher living standards. We're not just calculated GDP for GDP sake, but to achieve higher living standards. Um, so, I mean, you, you're putting a real, uh, some concrete numbers on, you know, the cost of discrimination on innovation today. Um, what are some, what are the solutions that you're thinking about? What, what are the ways in which we can actually achieve those higher growth rates and, and get the, the, get the kinds, get those innovation gains that you're talking about? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because in a recent Brookings paper, I focus on the end of the process, the commercialization process, what we might be able to do to enhance uh, commercialization, get more uh, diversity in uh, commercialization of invention, uh, the end of the process, and with a new working paper, a new paper published through the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, I focus on the beginning of that process. So let's take the uh, latter first. I think with respect to the beginning of the process, I think about this in three stages. I think about innovation in three stages. In education, uh, typically, but not exclusively in STEM education. Secondly, in the practice of invention, say in labs, um, in graduate school labs uh, or labs outside of graduate school for example, and then I think about the commercialization phase where uh, the invention is commercialized and this involves IPOs, this involves uh, founders uh, getting VC investment, for example. So um, I think about those three. So I concentrated on the two endpoints for these two papers. For the Washington Center for Equitable Growth paper, what I focused on was exposure to invention. How do we increase the uh, number of kids or the share of kids who are interested in invention? And I'm not the only one concerned about this. Uh, Raj Chetty and his co-authors have a, a paper that uh, has similar uh, conclusions to mine that uh, the more exposure a child has to an inventor, the higher one's life outcomes. So I would say early exposure to invention and innovation. Uh, the Limelson Center has a place called Spark Lab where school kids come every day uh, in normal times. Uh, they come every day and they have seven or eight steps to follow while they walk through the Spark Lab and they create their own inventions and they figure out what's useful about that invention and how they might be able to uh, sell that invention. So I think it's actually a really good exercise and they are just so delighted to walk out of the Spark Lab with their own invention. I, you just see children's eyes light up. So I think that's one, one thing to do. Of course, there's uh, mentoring that can be done, uh, mentoring of young inventors uh, through NSF, through uh, NASA, through other uh, means. So there's, uh, there's that, but it's not just mentoring. On the commercialization end, uh, one thing that has to be addressed is workplace climate. Uh, this is something that I wrote about, but it's become even more urgent as uh, as unions begin to form at tech firms, for example, not to necessarily raise pay, but to address issues related to sexual harassment, uh, racial harassment, uh, et cetera. So I think that there are some ways to, to address uh, worker climate. And that's true. It's not just for workers, it's for founders. Uh, that would be the subject of this part of the uh, innovation phase, and those who are receiving VC funding. Only 1% of all founders who receive uh, venture capital funding are African-American, 0.2% are African-American women. Uh, only 5% are women. That's That's got to change because that represents an entire network. And that means that we're leaving a lot of ideas on the table. That's where this calculation of up to 4.4% of GDP per capita comes from. We're leaving a lot of ideas on the table. And that means that CEOs 
of uh, a lot of the tech firms within the innovation economy are not being the best stewards of the talent they have. And if I were a shareholder, I would ask that uh, the CEOs be more responsible for augmenting the talent they have and finding the talent they don't have. Um, yeah, I, I, this issue to me is so important. And I know, I, at least I know I've told you this before that my, my eight-year-old son, that's, he, I, he wants to be an inventor. I got uh, uh, something home from school a year ago. So when he was seven, was uh, every kid in the school had to make a picture about what they want to be when they grow up. And then they took a big class picture with them all holding the signs. And his said, uh, uh, inventor. And mm -hmm. I like, I don't know where that came from, but it's obviously coming from the fact that it, he sees that as something he could be. Um, right. And I, I, you know, it, it, when I looked at his whole class, there were mm -hmm. Gender stereotypes around what the girls were holding up in terms of what they wanted to be and what the boys sure. were. There were no girls sure. holding up inventor signs. Oh, yeah. And that, sure. I, I, I have a story like that. Can I tell my story that's similar? So I took a Girl Scout troop from Ypsilanti to see hidden figures. And when I was looking for, so the there was a party afterwards and a party before, a party before to kind of introduce them to the topic. And we had rockets, and we had toy rockets, we had all kinds of uh, books about rockets and, and so on. So, you know, it was meant to be fun play space. When I went looking for those, all of the rockets were in the boys section. The women's section, the girls section rather, was um, and this is in several toy stores. The girls section was all pink and all ballerina type stuff. I was so angry. I could not have been angrier that there was this bifurcation. Everything having to do with space, astronauts, with exploration had, or science had to do with boys. And I was just, I was livid. So I bought all those things from the boys section and we went and played with them before and after uh, we saw a hidden figure. So I think that there's something really wrong with the programming that we instill in girls and boys at, at very, very early ages. That should not be cut off for girls. Well, I think this really comes to thinking about implicit bias. Um, and, you know, implicit bias seems to be the hardest thing for us to get past, right? Um, what, so, what's implicit about that, Betsy? What's implicit about <laughs> that? They, they yeah. had, I am telling you, there was nothing that had to do with space and science for girls. That, that is not implicit. Somebody is explicitly <laughs> making a decision to, to not give women interesting things to do, not give girls interesting things to do. I, I beg to differ. It's not implicit. Oh. Uh, that is not implicit and I, I um, but I was thinking of the fact that my, my daughter actually complained in uh, preschool because she said the girls bathroom has butterflies and the boys bathroom has space and I like space better than butterflies. Um, and it was like the boys bathroom was all decorated in like rockets and planets and the girls like butterflies. And that's, but I think that's, you're right. Is that implicit or explicit? But it's people not thinking. They're it's not criminal. thinking about the. Are they not the thinking? Are they not thinking? Are they not thinking? That I think that's that is a possibility that they're not thinking, or maybe they're 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 thinking, and they're not they're not thinking broadly about what girls can be and what girls can do, or what boys can be and what they they can do. Because it's putting both of them in, in these boxes. So, uh, Lisa, I just have... And one thing that you uh, know about, Betsy, is that my work suggests that there should be the free flow of ideas. And one thing that inhibits the free flow of ideas is racism and sexism. And if you can't have on your patent team the people who help to augment invention, who have different lived experiences and different ideas, 
then you can't have the best ideas and you can't be the most productive in these outcomes. So we should mitigate these, uh, these barriers in any way we can. And I think that making sure that there are, uh, are spaceships on the walls of the girls' bathrooms and uh, women in space, uh, women astronauts or women doing experiments. I think that's what we have to do to make sure that we overcome the racism and sexism that can inhibit and other barriers, not just racism and sexism, other barriers to participating in a diverse innovation economy. So, um, Lisa, I am sorry that I was having internet problems. It seems like I've got like the world's fastest internet speed until it's time for me to actually do a live uh, event. And then the internet <laughs> gods come down on me and steal my internet. <laughs> the, uh, but um, I've switched to my cell phone, so we'll see if uh, you know the cellular network saves the day. Um, but I, I appreciate you just going forward with that. Look, let's turn to some audience questions. And um, uh, you know, one question we got was, how uh, can principals of economics instructors incorporate more diversity into their classroom um, as they help students see economics in their daily lives? So um, as you can probably imagine, um, that's a, a question that's near and dear to my heart, but um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I think the first way to do it is to look at the textbooks, uh, yours, the uh, Krugman and Wells textbooks that have uh, diverse examples in them. The last time I talked to uh, Paul Krugman and Robin Wells about their, uh, their textbooks, they were negotiating with the publisher to use uh, gender neutral pronouns. So I think that, that there are some that are much more progressive and inclusive uh, than others. That's one thing. The other thing is with respect to topics, we have a, a core econ, for example, that looks at uh, you know, uh, examples broadly uh, related to economics. And I've, I've recorded one uh, section on innovation uh, as well as on, on violence and the rule of law. So I think that there are creative ways that we're thinking about, uh, economists are thinking about and creating materials for to be able to see themselves as economists or see themselves as uh, inventors, as it were. Um, so I, I well, Lisa, I just have to tell you that um, Paul and Robin's textbook publisher is my textbook publisher. We were the very first textbook they ever published using uh, um, gender neutral pronouns, um, third person pronouns. Um, and it was funny because we did it uh, very purposefully and then it went to the copy editor and she corrected it all um, and turned all our singular use days into he or she. And I right. an undergrad who was an RA for me and he wrote me a long e impassioned email about how important <laughs> it was that I reject the copy editors. Sure. Questions. Sure. <laughs> now that's great. That that's great. Uh, to the public. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. The, um, and, and, um, and, you know, I think it's, um, I mean, I think that's critical, but what they've been doing for the 20 or so years that I've been using their textbooks, I don't think it's been 20 years. It's probably been about 15 years or a decade, is that they've had many more people of color and many more people and, uh, from other places of other uh, national origins in most textbooks. So that's why I have relied heavily on uh, their textbooks for my classes, just because of their um, their race and ethnicity representation and gender representation. Yeah, well, I, uh, the um, let's let's turn to um, to some questions that have come in around uh, patents. So you've talked a lot about your patent research. Um, patents often have a lag time from the date of filing until they are issued, often years. Do the current trends suggest that the gap observed is going to narrow as women hold increasingly numbers of positions in, in some 
scientific disciplines and health professions? Are you at all optimistic that we're starting to see a turn in the, uh, of the tide? The USPTO has been, the US Patent Office, um, Patent and Trademark Office, has been following this more closely than I have. And what they see is an increase um, over a short period of time in the 2000s of women participating in invention and innovation. So I'm visiting at the USPTO as an Edison Scholar right now, and I'm hoping to extend their research to race and ethnicity, not just to, um, to, to women. And I think that, um, I, I really don't think that we're gonna have fewer women patenting as they move into positions of uh, responsibility. They're already moving into positions of responsibility. Remember, there's, there's, there's a bottleneck. So think about, uh, let me give you an example that one of the inventors gave me. When they are uh, a, a, an inventor in a tech firm in Silicon Valley, when they are meeting at 7 p.m. on a project, you know, the women on the project have gone home. And, you know, while they're having their uh, Fruit Loops and playing soccer, you know, <laughs> and then showing up for a project meeting, that really disadvantages women who have familial responsibilities or they uh, have other uh, responsibilities at home or, you know, they simply aren't interested in working uh, 24 hours a day, and that disadvantages uh, the the women who are on their team. So I think we can think about ways to uh, to be more inclusive with respect to women on site uh, childcare, for example. Uh, I think that would uh, address some of these uh, some of these issues uh, or. Uh, subsidies, if we're talking about Silicon Valley, subsidies to make sure that women can live closer to, uh, to work, uh, especially if they have to live farther away. But anyway, I think there are many interventions that we could see to augment women's participation and that of African-Americans without worrying about uh, them going into higher uh, positions. The, the fear is the opposite. I think if you if you look on Twitter today to see uh, how um, you know the problems associated with being a woman or being uh, being a, a racial or ethnic minority um, is in many of these tech firms, um, the I don't think that there is a worry about uh, too many of them uh, going into positions. I think. If we kept the status quo, I think we should worry about having a declining uh, rate of arrival of ideas. So um, what do you think things like, you know, if you look at the Obama administration, it was historically diverse. And I think uh, the Biden administration has just, you know, uh, taken that uh, even further. Mm -hmm. How important do you think these, uh, you know, these efforts and these movements to create diversity at uh, higher levels of government like that, how important are they for enacting change? I think they're fundamental. I think that, I'll, I'll refer to Janet Yellen with respect to her reflections on the financial crisis. The lack of lived experience among many of those who uh, lived experience in the economy, a, a different lived experience in the economy, likely led to groupthink among those who were supposed to be monitoring the data, monitoring the analysis. And I really think that we uh, women come to the economy in a different way. African-Americans come to the economy in a different way. And African-Americans are often the canary in the coal mine. They certainly were in the 2008 recession, whereby African-Americans were receiving these exotic mortgages when they actually deserved prime mortgages. And this was happening early on in California and Georgia and other states where they had uh, mortgage crisis early on. So if someone had been paying attention to African-American 
uh, mortgages and, and lending practices or ones that were pitched to African-Americans, I think we would have caught this uh, much earlier. So I think that having people in positions of responsibility. Now, Janet started taking advantage of the these data when she was president of San Francisco FUD. So, you know, uh, in that sense, leadership matters uh, in terms of the kind of data you collect, the kind of analyses you do, and the kind of policy, policy decisions you make. So I think um, this, is, this is good for the economy, and I think it's good for the country. So I'd love to actually pivot from that to uh, a, a, a sort of nitty gritty economics question for you, which is, you know, you, you mentioned in the 2008 recession, African-Americans were the canary in the coal mine. They were getting these exotic mortgages. Um, there's a lot of credit being extended. Um, in many cases, I think we'd say too much um, credit in a way that led to the subprime mortgage crisis. We actually see the opposite happening right now. Uh, lenders are really tightening credit um, and they're tightening it based on things like FICO scores. Um, and as a result, the people who are getting squeezed out of being able to borrow are African-Americans. Um, mm -hmm. So what I just wanted you to think about, like how do we balance, like access to credit is actually really important for uh, thinking about improving living standards. So, um, you know, have we gone too far? And then what do we do about the fact that when, you know, lending standards tighten, it that disproportionately hurts African-Americans? I, I think there are a couple of answers to that question. The first answer is, remember what I was saying about the mortgages. Um, often African-Americans were, off, were offered some prime mortgages when they actually should have had prime mortgages. So we need to stop the racism that occurs in uh, in lending, and so that's so that's one answer to the problem. So that's in mortgage lending. That's just related to mortgage lending. With lending more broadly, what we saw in the first rollout of the CARES Act with the PPP was that African American businesses and Hispanic businesses. Uh, couldn't get access to PPP loans. And when they got access, they got a small share of what they were actually asking for, unlike their white counterparts. Well, why is that? Because the program relied, just like the SBA does in general, on large financial institutions. And historically, there has been a problem associated with uh, lending, borrowing and lending with these large lenders uh, with respect to African Americans. Now, of course, there are CDFIs and minority deposit institutions who try to address these issues. But if you just stop the racist practices, you won't have to have all of these different institutions and different forms of, of uh, institutions to be able to address the problem, address discrimination in lending. And I think that that is the fundamental issue. So I don't think that we've gone too far. I don't think we've gone far enough. Why aren't we? Why are we still talking about discrimination and lending? That shouldn't. That shouldn't still be happening. And we have all of these audit studies. You are as aware, uh, aware of them as I am, Betsy. I I relied upon a car service, a car buying service, because what I knew from these audit studies was that black women did the worst when it came to negotiating a car. And I don't, I, I don't have time for all that. You know, I just don't, don't have time for the discrimination. Just would like a fair price for the, uh, for the vehicle. And I still had to wind up negotiating something. And until I got what I wanted, I sat, sat there for like six hours. Definite waste of my time, but I wasn't leaving until I got another plan for my car that was fair, that I thought was fair. Uh, I mean that you know, as you said, without a doubt, like the research is clear that there's just discrimination in lending. Uh, there's discrimination, uh, uh, you know, across the board. But the um, I, what I was just trying to say is that um, you know, right now what we're seeing is that peeling back of lending, that credit tightening, and that I think exacerbates both what you might think of as just 
you know, as uh, the statistical discrimination. So African Americans have, uh, uh, on average, uh, slightly worse FICO scores than, uh, and as a result, it just on paper that would contribute to them getting less access to credit. Um, it's also the case that it, there's this is relationships. So, Len, when you rely on the big banks, they tend to go with the people they have relationships with. And that you get, you know, pure you get that discrimination as well, not just on paper, but now you're dealing with they know the person and they're putting the thumb on the scale for their mate. Um, so, right. But I don't, you know, or, I, or for the, yeah. the company that they have. Like many black economists, I reject the notion of statistical uh, discrimination just because what it says is that on average, X is the case. Well, why is it the case? Why is it the case? I mean, what we know about FICO scores is that often they they inject um, residential segregation into the calculation. So you just pay more um, because you're living in a, a, a certain area. And the same is true for, you know, auto uh, auto insurance. I mean, these credit scores uh, affect a whole range of credit products. And I think that we have to be more aggressive in making sure that these are not, uh, are, that discrimination is taken out at every, uh, at every juncture. Uh, so, so it can be, you know, if it happens with regularity, we need to address where that regularity is coming from. And like I said, a lot of it has to do with residential segregation that is um, getting worse and not better. Um, we have to address things like occupational segregation. So occupational segregation may lead to the kinds of uh, statistical discrimination that you're talking about. And if we didn't have um, discrimination in occupation, we wouldn't probably have as many African-Americans whose FICO scores are very low. Uh, if, we, if they weren't stuck in some of these, uh, some of these jobs and in this pandemic, that has made a big difference. Uh, absolutely. And that was what I was trying to get us to talk a little bit about is like, how do we deal with these entrenched things like differences in FICO scores? Because um, right. it seems like you you do have to dig into like the, you have to keep digging. No, you do. No, that's, um, that's and true. I, and you, you have, have to, to that, you know, one, you, one person in the, you have to keep digging. I mean, one of the things that we um, looked at when I was at uh, when I was at CEA, when I was at the White House, was having having firms incorporate things like utility bills into uh, FICO scores, and I think that this and, and other uh, credit records, right? And I think that this has been done in some cases, and I think that helps everybody because this is something that. Uh, everyone typically pays, but through no fault of their own, uh, many Americans uh, had much lower uh, FICO scores, had much uh, lower uh, credit scores than you would uh, you would anticipate. So anyway, I think we we have to keep digging because there's a there's a lot there. There's a lot that is contained in our race variable in economics. So we have to keep digging to uh, address every facet of uh, discrimination. So um, somebody in the audience said, you know, there, there's been legislation passed to try to combat racism and sexism in the workplace, um, but it seems like these are largely social issues without clear government solutions. So I'm gonna reject that uh, premise, I bet you are too, but how do we think about what sounds to some people as social issues, how, why, why, how do we explain why there's a policy, uh, why there needs to be a policy solution? Well, I would say that there needs to be a policy solution because all Americans suffer from the effects of racism. As I wrote in my New York Times column in November, racism just doesn't hurt the intended targets, but the economy is uh, trillions of dollars smaller than it should be because of racism. 
So we could do a lot, whether it's in lending or it's in an employment, um, we can do a lot more to have a more inclusive economy and a larger economy. So that's why I would uh, reject it. These aren't just uh, social issues. And um, unless we, so somebody, and, and, go ahead, go ahead. Well, so did somebody asked specifically about um, SB 979 in California. I don't know if you're aware of this policy. I wouldn't have known it by the name, um, but it requires yeah. publicly held corporate it uh, requires publicly held corporations in California to achieve diversity on their board of directors by January 2023. That's right. That's right. I've written about this. Yes. So, uh, and so I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. I think if if Europe, the firms in Europe have had this requirement for some time, and what we see, um, what we typically see, is higher returns for those firms. And we also see more inclusion of, of women in those experiments. The only, uh, I applaud the adoption of this by the state of California and the increase in the number of women who should be on the board. I, I you know, you want to avoid groupthink, bring in different lived experiences, but I would say it needs to be extended to racial and ethnic minorities, not just to women. Um, but I think it's a good thing. So, I think it's a good thing. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I, uh, it, it's, you know, looking at all the research on that, it, it feels like it's very hard. Um, you know, you know, we, we need to be thinking about both the short run and the long run implications of that kind of diversity, uh, uh you know, in terms of managing companies. And I, I think, um, for sure, we're at a point where we're realizing that in order to continue to be innovative and to adapt, if you don't have diversity of thought, you're just not going to be able to do it. And I think we are moving to a new, to an era where, you know, we, we, without getting that, without getting that kind of diversity of thought, we're going to struggle to continue to, to innovate and grow, which is where we started this conversation. Um, let's, right. I, let me ask one last question. If I can just say, if I can just say, it's it's not just diversity of thought; it's di diversity of lived experience. So certainly, you can get uh, diversity of thought from as a derivative of uh, lived experience, but I think it's also uh, diversity of of lived experience. I mean, so that's a really really important point, and I I you know. I honestly, I think, I think that diversity of thought so much comes out of diversity of lived experience that I, I think about it as, mm -hmm. in the diversity of thought. But you're absolutely right that it is about your lived experience. And, um, you know, I, I, I served in government as a mom with young kids, and I know that I saw the world differently. I saw policies differently than I, mm -hmm. than I I had seen that before I had those young kids. And now that my kids are getting older, I'm also seeing the world slightly differently, right? I'm mm -hmm. now thinking about things uh, differently. And I, you really do see, you know, and it, this, to come back to like part of our earlier conversation, you know, why is it that I think we see so much uh, of one way of looking at the world in so many economics textbooks? It's because there's not much diversity in the authors. And they not right. so you don't have a lot of diversity of lived experience in the people developing right. the material. So uh, I, right. I I love that, um, and I'm going to make sure that I I'm going to use your language. I hope you're okay with that going forward. I'm <laughs> going to talk right. about that's quite all right. Of lived experience. Um, so right. let me end by asking you, um, you know, in a lot of ways, the CARES Act I thought was incredibly successful at. Uh, helping the economy, but it did miss a lot of people. You, you mentioned the PPP and the discrimination and the loans. Um, how does the new stimulus bill address the kinds of disparities that uh, you've seen so far in how policymakers have responded to our current crisis? Well, I think that one big element, one big change is uh, that for the new PPP, they're allowing, they allowed uh, those who are in disadvantaged circumstances to get 
to the window first. And I, I see those not only as being African-American and um, Latino business owners, uh, given uh, sort of uh, first dibs at the PPP, having been disadvantaged uh, before, but also the smallest firms. You know, a lot of firms for the SBA program, you have to have two years of, of financial records. And if you don't have two years of financial records, you're just shut out. But CDFIs and other uh, institutions can help address that. Now, why is that important? A lot of our innovation comes from the smallest firms. They are new firms because they have new ideas. And what I worry about is long-term growth. If they don't have access, then we can't take advantage of the new ideas they bring to the economy. So I, I hope that that is one of the corrections and certainly a big correction. I hope that's coming in the new stimulus bill is aid to state and local governments, because as we know, you and I both know from the previous recession, this is where a lot of the unemployment comes from. And we've got, you know, nine to 10 million people to find jobs for uh, once this thing is over or at the current state. I, of course, that might change, but still, we've got to. We, we, we've got to make sure that the economy is up and running in every way it can be and is greased to be able to absorb uh, the talent that we have in the economy. Well, uh, with that, let me thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Um, it's always a real pleasure to hear from you, to learn from you, um, and I really enjoyed our conversation today. I enjoyed it too. The pleasure is all mine, Betsy. Take care.